Hi everybody, um, welcome to tonight's event, How to Be an Anti-Racist Ally with Sophie Williams, all about her brand new book, uh, and she's going to be uh, interviewed by Natalie Denny tonight. Well, welcome to one of our final events as part of uh, Black History Month. This has been um, kind of four weeks of us uh, of a, a smaller festival that we put on here at Writing on the Wall. We've still got more um, events to come. So tomorrow we've got the Goddess Project, the Black Girl Lit Club from seven o'clock that Natalie is one of the founders of. Um, and then on Thursday at 7 p.m. we've got Windrush, Music of the People. And this is the launch of our book from SS Orbiter to Orbital. That was part of an archive project that looked back at the influence the Windrush generation had on the music scene here in Liverpool. Um, and then we're finishing up uh, with a story time from Claire Hooken at 11 a.m. on Friday. So please do make sure to tune in to our final events this week. Um, but less from me. Um, I'm going to introduce Natalie, who's going to be chairing tonight's event. Um, Natalie is a writer, activist and community engagement manager. She's a chair of the Period Project Merseyside and Merseyside Together Against Fascism and Fashion, an umbrella organisation for anti-racist and anti-fascist groups. She's the founder of The Goddess Project, an organisation with the mission to empower, inspire and assist black women. Um, and she's also just started a brand new project, which I'm sure she can tell you about, um, Sky Writers. So can we give a huge, warm, virtual welcome to Natalie Denny. Hi, Natalie. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm so excited for tonight's event. Me too. I'm really, really excited to be here. So thank you very much for asking me to come and um, chair this event with Sophie Williams today. I'm really looking forward to getting into the conversation. You're very welcome. See you in a bit. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, hi everyone and thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm just going to start by um, introducing Sophie and telling you a little bit about Sophie Williams. As, um, I'm sure you know already, but we're going to go over it again. Sophie Williams is a leading anti-racism advocate, advocate and activist. She is a regular panellist, speaker, consultant and workshop facilitator with a focus on anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. Her writing has appeared in publications such as The Guardian, Hustle and Cosmopolitan. Before beginning writing, Sophie had a career in advertising, particularly in social agencies, where she held the position of COO. In 2019, Sophie left traditional agencies in order to create her own business, working with clients such as Netflix on projects combining her professional advertising experience with active anti-racism work. Sophie's second book, Millennium Black, will be published in April 2021. The current book that we're going to be talking about today is anti-racist ally an introduction to action and activism which i'm really excited to talk about so if you could warmly welcome sophie williams i feel warmly welcomed thank you sophie for joining us you look fabulous by the way i am a love the lipstick you look on me oh and the nails i love it <laughs> it's an absolute mess it's all broken <laughs> to be up fair i'm like that as well my um my um nail um, beautician is on maternity leave <laughs> so I'm out for a bit as well so Sophie it's a pleasure to have you with us today how are you feeling yeah good thank you it's a pleasure to be with you and it also sounds like you're doing some amazing things I wasn't aware of all of the things that you co-founded and founded and are working on it sounds incredible Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think it um, links a lot into the to themes of your book in terms of activism and action and anti-racism. Um, the Goddess Projects are currently running a training um, called um, Ally 101, an anti-racist introduction as well for people within Liverpool. Um, so when I first picked up this book, I knew that you were um, coming virtually to Liverpool. I was so excited to have these conversations because I think it's so important for us to talk about what allyship actually means and what um, activism, you know, what it lies at the heart of activism, and there's so many really amazing points within the book. In the original list, there was just like pages of stuff that I wanted to ask you, and I thought you're going to have to condense this, we haven't got a long time. Um, so um, I think it'd be great if you could possibly read um, a section of your book, if that's okay, Sophie, and then we can go from there in terms of discussing it further. Absolutely. Beautiful, love the colour. <laughs> oh my god, so just as a side note, um, Millennial Black, the book that I started working on first that's coming out second, is a joke about Millennial Pink. And I am trapped in this colour scheme for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's just me now. This is my life. Um, but there are worse things that can happen. It is. Um, it is. So when we were talking about, oh, it was weird. Like, I haven't even cracked the spine of this. 
Um, when we were talking about what to read, you said that you thought the introduction would be good. So I'm going to do you the intro and do you think the discussion of terms is interesting at the start? Yeah? Okay, so we'll do those. It's interesting, like it's strange for me because um, so much of my work um, usually is like digital and social. And so it's really weird for me to have like made something that I can hold in my hands. And um, I've not read it since I did the audiobook recording because it's like, it's weird to like make something and then it's like in the world. Uh, so let's figure it out. Let's see how we go. I hold it so it's in shot. It's like a bedtime story. <laughs> so we begin with, hi, congratulations on taking your first step in becoming an anti-racist ally. I'm so glad to have you here. This book is deliberately small and a starting point for those who want to learn to become anti-racist allies by joining the fight for racial equality for those who have already made a start and don't know what to do next or how to keep up the momentum. It's a bite-sized introduction to the things you need to know to lay the best foundation in your anti-racist allyship journey. You can share it with the people in your life who want to use their voices and platforms to make the world a better place, but don't know where to begin, or with those whom you want to have difficult conversations. It's small and accessible resource for you to refer back to along the way. Although I've spent years working in and talking about social justice, I began writing this book in the wake of the tragic murders that shocked the world in 2020 and galvanized many who had never considered their role in anti-racism to take action in their own lives. I want to be honest with you from the start, allyship is not always easy. There are no shortcuts or quick wins, but it's nowhere near as difficult as facing racism in your everyday life. Oh, my lipstick's bad. Fixed, okay. <laughs> you will have conversations with people who simply do not want to change the way that things have always been. Speaking truth to power and saying it with your whole chest is not meant to be easy. If it were, it would have already happened. There will be a lot of times when you feel that you're pushing against a brick wall. There will be other times when it feels like you're making good progress only to be told no or let down at the last minute. Moments like this can't be the end of your journey. They must instead be a chance to regroup, take stock and try again, even harder than before. The purpose of this book is to challenge the things that we've always been taught based on white supremacy and to seek better and fairer ways to move forward. Questioning the ways by which we operate can feel threatening or even like an attack. And our response can be to close ourselves off and become defensive. It's important to remember that this is a learning process and part of that is facing difficult truths and feeling uncomfortable working through that. Fight the urge to pull away and make space for discomfort. Finally, while anti-racism is the focus of this book, the conversation about allyship is not limited to race. Each of us is an individual made of several facets. Our race is one of those but so is our sexuality, gender identity, neurodiversity, class, economic status, and disability status, among other things. I hope some of the things we discuss here will help you to feel empowered and encouraged to be the best ally that we can be to all marginalized people. We need you to be a part of the change. Discussion of terms. Oh, my bad nail varnish, front and center. <laughs> I mean, if it hears you for Lent. <laughs> I'm never gonna be a real influencer because I can't do this stuff, but <laughs> discussion of terms. I thought long and hard about the terms to use in this book about anti-racist allyship. I'm a black woman. And so my instinct is to focus on blackness as that, the, that is the where the majority of my research and the entirety of my lived experience lies. However, we all know that black people are not the only marginalized people due to the color of our skin in Western society. So to exclude other marginalized groups doesn't feel right. On the other hand, I don't like terms like BIPOC, BAME and POC. That's right, I said it. The reason I don't like them is that I believe, despite these being terms used to refer to non-white people, every one of them centers on whiteness. 
BIPOC, BAME and POC all split people into just two groups, white and other. In each case, whiteness is a group on its own, distinct from all else. Whiteness stands alone as a status quo against which all other ethnic groups are defined. Everyone who isn't white is lumped together through terms like BAME, and POC and BIPOC without thought for their individual experiences. In this way, white becomes binary, white or not white, and all of the subtlety, richness and variety of different groups is whitewashed away. After much internal deliberation, I've decided to say marginalized groups or just marginalized so far as possible, rather than to use a term that I find difficult or to focus on blackness at the expense of all other marginalized racial groups. On occasions where for one reason or another that's not possible, I will use BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Colour, a term which puts those who are most impacted um, in American society front and centre, and BAME, Black Asian Ethnic Minority, as used by researchers whose work I'm referencing. When I say society, I'm speaking about Western society, and I appreciate the nuances of race and racism are not universally similar. When I originally wrote this book, I used the spelling women with an X throughout in order to be inclusive. However, this spelling has since become a term co-opted by those who want to deny the true womanhood of trans and non-binary women. So instead, I have used women spelt in the traditional ways. But please know that when I say women, I mean all who identify as such, and that all women are real women. So that's my introduction and my discussion of terms. Brilliant. Um, I really loved the introduction because for me, a good introduction sets the scene about what is to come next. And I think from the outset, it's very clear about what type of book this is and what type of experience we really have with reading it. So my first question to you, Sophie, is because the introduction sets the scene for the book and early on we're told allyship is not always easy and it can be uncomfortable. Can you talk about the importance of opening with that um, really strong statement? Yeah, it's actually something that I spoke to my editor about, something that I was really keen to sort of have early on, because I think the fact that it can be uncomfortable, because what we're asking people to do is we're asking people to challenge the ways that things have been, we're asking people to challenge the things that they've been told are fine. We're asking people to have conversations that they've been told are rude. You don't talk about sex, you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about race. And if you want to sort of do this work, you have to talk about all of them. So it's not hard in as much as it's not someone's knee pressing down on your neck. It's not hard in as much as you're not, I would say generally speaking, in physical danger, but it can be uncomfortable. And if you're going to sort of start this work, you have to know that it's not, it's not always the easiest experience. So, you know, sometimes people will say, yes, I'd love to do that. But, you know, if I spoke out about that at work, I'd be branded as, as difficult. And like, my answer is, yeah, be difficult. That's what we need you to be. We need you to, like, uh, like John Lewis has said, we need you to get into good trouble. Good trouble is worth getting into. Definitely. Thank you very much for that. So the second question I have is one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was the no nonsense, almost like conversational um, tone. It felt like I was speaking to someone I knew and it created a safe space for crit critical thinking, really. Um, and that's one of the things that really grabbed me in terms of the book. Um, was this an intentional choice on your part? No. <laughs> <laughs> Expand? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> so... The tone of, so this is, to me, an interesting book because it's not the book I intended to have first. I've been working on Millennial Black for several years, and that is sort of very, very researched, very, very academic, very, very sort of structured piece of work and piece of writing. And that's what I thought I would sort of meet the world with, this sort of very um, stats and facts and research academic piece of writing. Um, and in order to sort of build up a potential community for that long term, I got the Instagram account because my work has always been um, 
on social and my work has been around building fandoms and so if you're going to have something that's coming out you need to build a community around that so those people will buy it engage with it feel like a part of it and be a part of it and so that's why I have the official millennial black Instagram account and that was that was nothing like in I got that in January or February and I was talking to and about black women that was always my focus um and then George Floyd was murdered, Brianna Taylor was murdered, Ahmed Aubrey was murdered, Benny Majinga died when she didn't need, all of these terrible things kept happening to black people. And it was so hard and I just, so I have this open plan house um, and so I felt really sad and really like I didn't know what to do, but we're all in COVID and we have this open plan flat, which means I just spent the day like, crying into a pillow in my bathroom because you know for other people life has to go on like conference calls has to happen like work has to go on so I just spent the day like being very very sad um which doesn't say that my partner abandoned me but he did have to go to work um and so the tone of the book is very much in inspired by the tone of that Instagram interestingly um and I didn't think I'd ever be someone who had things that way around but I made a post about allyship. Um, I had a couple of hundred followers. Um, within a week, I had several thousand followers and I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm gonna be able to like do a swipe up. I wonder what that's like. Um, and then it sort of just kept growing. And so I was able to go to HarperCollins and say, I want to pitch a book to you. I want it to be about allyship. And I want it to be similar to the work that I've been doing, although accidentally on this platform um, and so it's much more me than I've intended um, but I think I hope that it's benefited from that because I think I'm trying to sort of explain quite big things in quite a, a small number of words and hopefully if I can sort of be encouraging and be a person instead of just an anonymous message then hopefully that sort of humanizes not me but the experience of the work that we're trying to ask people to get involved with um that was a really long answer <laughs> <laughs> no i appreciate it i think for me you know that explanation about trying to sort of condense something that's actually quite vast concept into something smaller i think that was done really really well within the book and it was something that i thought that you know i can sit here and have conversations with people and start you know going on me pet me high horse and stuff but actually you need to speak to people and you need to be able to do it in a way that um they can understand and that communicates and I feel that I could give that book to someone and they could read it and come back and have you know a critical conversation with me whether they agreed or not I feel that it, it allows them concepts to be digested in a way that um is, is a step-by-step -step approach really so I was really pleased with the way it was done I was really really happy with it I was reading it and every now and then I go oh <laughs> you know, you've got the sound effects to your book that you read. Ooh, I like that one I'll make a note of that one <laughs> so definitely Amazing. do you remember when I don't know if you had these in your little but when I was little I really loved the books that actually did have sound effects in them yes. so you can like get to like a certain word that word's a picture you press the picture it goes like ah, ah. maybe it should be like we need to bring that format back Okay, I'm literally writing this down. Yeah, bring it back for adults. I think we'd love it. <laughs> it's a really engaging thing reading sometimes, and it actually has quite visceral reactions. So yeah, I can see that working brilliantly. Yeah, I've written it down. Great stuff. So um, the next question is about there's um, like a number of quotes within the book um, from someone separate from yourself. So there's one from Angela Davis in there. I think there's might be two from Angela Davis in there. There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Can you elaborate on the themes of intersectionality and allyship, please? Yes. So I do a lot of um, talking. I do a lot of talking <laughs> at the moment um, in different businesses and in different organisations, really talking about allyship. And I don't feel like I'm able to have that conversation until I've laid the grounds of intersectionality, because I really want people to recognise their privileges. And I think a really sort of knee-jerk reaction to being told to recognise your privileges or being asked to recognise your privileges is to say, I don't have them. Like, my life hasn't been easy, everything hasn't been handed to me, I've had to work hard. And I think 
we can really benefit from the nuance, nuance of that conversation when we understand intersectionality. So when we say that someone has privilege, we don't mean that everything's been handed to them. All we mean is that there are some areas of your life where you haven't had to struggle. And I think the best way to understand that is by understanding the sort of various facets that make us all up. So like when you speak to me, I'm not just a woman, I'm not just a black person, I'm not just a cisgender person, I'm not just an able-bodied person. I'm all of those things at once. And you can't just take out one of those bits and talk to me in that area. And I can't just take out one of those bits and only have you see me in that way. We're all multifaceted. And when we understand that, we can understand that people who have marginalized identities are often marginalized on various fronts at the same time. But we can also understand that when we have areas of marginalization, we also can at the same time have areas of privilege. So like I'm a black woman, so those are two sort of societally marginalized positions. But again, I'm cisgender, I'm able-bodied, I'm all of those things. And as black women go, I'm an incredibly light-skinned black woman and in a society that values whiteness, that is a privilege. And so once we understand that we're all made up of so many things, we can start to understand that they, that we ourselves don't have single issue fights because we're not single issue people. And then when we look at our wider community, we all have relationships with people who are not identical to us. And so we, we don't exist on one front and we're not fighting for one thing, we all have to be part of this together. Brilliant, thank you, that was a brilliant explanation. Thanks very much. And um, the next question links into your terms at the beginning of the book that you um, kindly read for us before. So the terms um, BIPOC or BAME and POC or POC, however you want to um, pronounce it, have recently come under fire due to how we can erase identities of marginalized people. This is addressed in the book. How can we dismantle these terms or do you think we actually need to? It's interesting because people often ask me, well, what do you want us to say instead? And I think if you're talking about an individual, if you call me a person of colour, like, why? Why can't you just say I'm a black woman? Because I am. Like, I think we've been told that talking directly about people's race is rude. But I think it's much ruder to erase an important part of someone and to just lump them in with a wider group. The reason, like I have to use those terms in the book and I have to use them in the work that I do because so much research and so much sort of government work in the UK is done using those groups. But what that does is it makes all of us one thing and it ignores the differences of our lived experiences and our outcomes. The outcomes in the UK for a Chinese woman are wildly different to a Caribbean black Caribbean woman, which again are really different to a black African woman, which are really different to a Bangladeshi woman. They're all different. And so to just have them all in one and to use that to make policy is really dangerous, I think, because we just make everyone else the same. And we don't do that to whiteness. We don't lump that in with everyone. They're allowed to be a group on their own, but everyone else is just othered. And so, what I really want to encourage people to do is to do research, create policy, looking at individual groups. People are like, what's a better word for talking about non-white people? We don't need a word that talks about all non-white people because we're not a homogenous group. We have to just get used to and comfortable with talking about people in the terms that they talk about themselves and recognizing that it is not a singular experience. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead to my question because what you've um, just spoke about in terms of whiteness, I think it links in quite nicely with this. So um, in the book, it states not thinking about race is a privilege. And can you elaborate that, how it links to your earlier question? Yeah, I think not thinking about race really is a privilege. And I think we hear it so much. We've just been like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's the same as people who are like, oh, I'm apolitical. I'm not interested in politics. What I think that really means is the way that politics is working is working for me at the moment. Because it's, I think, a real luxury to not have to think about those things in, in your life. Like, I don't know about you. I'd be interested to hear 
um, especially in sort of pre-COVID, pre-lockdown life, how often you think about your race, how often you're aware that you're not a white person. Because for me... (laughs) Every single day, every time I go anywhere, consistently. Yeah, absolutely. Because it really affects your lived experience because it affects how society views you. And so it's a real luxury, I think, to not have to have that thought, to not have to have the thought, like, is this person speaking to me, treating me, looking at me like this because of my race or because of some other facet? Like, the more, the further we are removed from whiteness, the further we are removed from society, what society sort of sees as that baseline of white, cisgender, heterosexual male, then the more we are the more we are forced to be aware of who we are and to think about that. And that thinking is tiring, not like thinking is tiring, thinking about these things is tiring, thinking about, am I safe in this situation? Am I safe in this space? How can I approach this job interview? How can I approach this date? How can I approach this simple trip to the post office? All of these things, we leave the house and we're aware of our race and to not have to have that added layer of thought on top of your life I think is a real privilege and a real advantage. Yeah I can completely completely agree I think um, for me it's like additional emotional labour on top of the emotional labour of being a black person in quite a white space so for me that makes perfect sense really about it being a privilege to not have to wonder about what area like I don't know about yourself but if I go on holiday I research what is racism like in this country Um, and and I make decisions based on that in order for safety so completely yeah Yeah, last time I went on holiday which you know COVID a while ago um (laughs) people would try and touch me people would take photos of me and I am as I said a really white privileged black person like like people will want to go to a pub or whatever you arrive there's a England flag a union jack outside like for other people that's not a thing for us we have to think is there a football match on or does that sort of mean that we're not really welcome here we're not really safe here and those those indications those sort of subliminal messages shouldn't mean that and people will say well, you know, the that flag isn't racist. And no, it doesn't need to be, but the way that we have as a society used that, we have come to learn what that means to us. And if other people haven't taken that on, it's because they don't have to do that double think of thinking, am I safe here? What does this mean for me? Definitely, definitely. Um, the next question is about anti-racism in terms of not being about self-improvement, which is stated within the book. Um, this is something that I'm really interested in um, because it's something that I think about in terms of why people are anti-racist and, if, and what is the integrity and the purpose behind it. So can you comment on that statement, please? So I think the statement is uh, like anti-racist allyship is not a self-improvement exercise, something like that. Um, and to me, it's really important because when we, a lot of people think and talk about it in terms of becoming a better person. And yeah, if you're anti-racist, you're, in my opinion, a better person than if you're a racist person. Like that to me is a fairly clear binary in, in my experience. Um, but that's not the outcome. That's not the end goal that we're working towards. Because when you make that the end goal, when you make you being a better person, the thing that we're working towards, you've then lost sight of the people who you are claiming to be an ally to, the people who you are claiming to care about the experience of. So to me, you have to, you have to separate yourself from that because then we're separate, then we're stepping into sort of savior territory because to me, the purpose of allyship, the purpose of anti-racism is to improve, uplift, amplify the voices, the experiences of the people who we are claiming to want to support. If we then change that focus and make it about what it means about us, I'm a good person, I've done this, I've done that, this is about me, then you've lost track of the site, you've lost, yeah, I think I can say that, you've lost track of the end goal, because the end goal, again, is not about you, for me, allyship, anti-racism, again, it's not about me. 
there is a huge global community that we are part of a conversation of. We, there is a huge global community that we're working within the context of. And so to bring it back into what it says about you, what it means for you, is to really have fundamentally misunderstood, I think, what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I completely understand. I think when we um, do the training, we talk sometimes about decentralisation of self um, when it comes to activism, especially when it comes to anti-racist anti activism, um, because it is for a, a greater good, as you have quite clearly said, about a community and about the heart of it, not being about individuals. Um, so the next question links into the Black Lives Matter movement. You talked earlier about how, um, it, you know, the sort of grief that you felt, you know, and how the galvanization of how it's got a lot of different organizations and individuals involved. So there's been a lot of people pledging and um, they support the Black Lives Matter movement. In football, for example, everyone takes a knee before the games. It's been on football kits. It's been a lot of high profile organizations have made comments and um, statements. Um, and in this book, you talk about performative allyship. Um, how can we counteract, counteract performative allyship? And could you talk a little bit about what that is for those who might be watching that don't understand? Yeah. So to me, performative allyship is really linked into what we were talking about a moment ago. And I'm not a football person. I didn't know footballers were taking a knee before the uh, before matches. And I can't really comment on that because I don't know sort of the wider cultural context. Although people doing that when they have a big platform, I think is sending potentially a valuable message. But again, I don't sort of have the, the most rounded view of that. Um, formative allyship, I think, is doing tokenistic things that don't have a long term value. And more than that, they, if they do have a value, the primary value is likely to be in the public perception of you. So again, we're going back to that sort of centering conversation, going back to the look what I've done, not necessarily look what I've done, look what a good person I am, but look what I've done, look at this sort of PRable uh, thing that I'm doing. And again, we've lost sight in that case of the people who we are claiming to want to be sort of on side with, the people who are claiming to want to be uplifting and amplifying and supporting. Because I think I ask people, would you be doing this if no one were looking? Would you be doing this if you couldn't post about it, would you be doing this? Like, you have to look at your motivations because when you do things that are performative, things that don't necessarily have a long-term value, things that don't necessarily have a big impact, I think is one of the biggest points about it. When you are focusing on how does this make me look instead of what is the impact of this, again, we're not, we're still using our energy, but we're not using it in an efficient way. And we're not using it to further those people, but we're using it to further ourselves. And I think that's the um, crux. Like, if you want to help people, help people. If you want to be supportive, be supportive. But if you want credit for that, then just don't think that you're on the track to be doing sustainable, impactful, long-term change. Brilliant, thank you. Um, my next question is one of my favourite um, quotes or paraphrases in the book is saying we are overacting or inventing issues cast us as unreliable narrators of our own lived experience. Um, as a black woman, this really struck a chord with me, um, and I often um, talk about um, racial mass gaslighting. I know that you've um, recently wrote um, a, 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 a article about racial gaslighting. Um, can you comment on the impact of this? Yes because I spoke to a psychologist about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's important to point out, I am not a mental health expert. I am not a psychologist. I have had the opportunity to speak to some um, because I've been writing this piece, as you mentioned, about racial gaslighting. And so racial gaslighting is, I think, like shooting the second arrow. So someone does something that is racially insensitive or outright racist, and then we go to somebody either someone in a position of power or a loved one, and we say, this thing happened. And instead of understanding, instead of taking that on, we get told, no, it didn't. Or maybe you're overreacting. Or, well, I'm sure they didn't mean it that way. And so we get hurt twice by that. So to me, racial gaslighting is just the constant belittling of our experiences and the constant impact of being told that we're making it up 
or we're overreacting or we're just not understanding the wider context. And that is really exhausting because what it does then is it says, essentially, either we don't believe you or you don't matter. And so like, that's exhausting. Imagine any other area of your life. Imagine, imagine it's not race. Imagine it's anything else. And you say, this thing happened. And someone looks you in the eye and says, no, it didn't. We just wouldn't accept that. And, you know, if you have people in your life who do that, not you personally, you shouldn't accept that because, you know, a lot of familial relationships, a lot of romantic relationships do have that dynamic and it's not healthy. It's recognised as a form of abuse. And so if someone is belittling your lived experiences, that is not a, a, a supportive environment for you to be in. And so it's not about making everything about race is about being able to have your lived experience believed because I also like that line like you're an, un, an unreliable narrator of your own experience I was like yes type that down off you go um, <laughs> click your fingers <laughs> because because I think it's just like the most efficient way I could say it like we we tell you what happened in our lives we narrate our lives back to you and you say no like I don't think I'm expressing what I want to say well, but what I want to say, I guess, is it's belittling, it's rude, it's not caring, it's it's a huge burden for someone to have gone to you and said this thing happened, and for you to just put it back on them, just to say, no, it didn't. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm expressing it well. So maybe what we can do is I can ask you why it resonated with you. I think, I think for me, um sometimes being a black woman for me feels like yeah you're drowning um you know we started the goddess projects because um we thought that a lot of being a black woman in popular discourse was framed through this guise of strife and when me and my two other co-founders Khadija and Dominique were together we just laughed we had an amazing time we supported each other and we were like oh we need to we need to bottle this we need to you know share this with the other women in our city and beyond um and I think we we were a bit of a breath of fresh air in that drowning pool to each other um, as black women in terms of a sisterhood. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it was the laughter, it was the jokes, it was all the fun, but it was also not being able to, not having to explain ourselves, um, you know, to say this happened to me. And instead of me trying to sort of lay down a backstory and sort of break down my experience to, um, make it a bit more palatable I was able to just say how it was and for that woman to sit there and go I know exactly what you're talking about or give an example of their own and um, so we were able to sort of um absorb each other's experiences but support and feel stronger for that so I think I didn't really realize how much that was missing for me to be able to have them conversations about the races and micro and macro aggressions that we were facing on a daily basis structurally and um, institutionally as well because for me that is that rather than the name calling and things like that institutional and structural racism is for me you know it's all terrible or well, that's the stuff that kills people so I think from our perspective to be able to have them conversations and be recognized and be seen and to be told oh you know actually yeah you're not mad <laughs> you're not lying Linking back to what you said we're not unreliable, unreliable narrators in our own experiences um it was sort of powerful to see it reflected in print um and to see it and, and the way we sort of like done that was to create this community of black women um, and women of color that we all support and um, that we all are able to have these conversations with and none of our experience are denied or belittled or um, minimized in any way we accept it and we don't have to explain it and that for us was such a powerful thing to be able to do so that's yeah. why it's just struck a chord with me really because I don't think I've ever heard it described in a way as um concise as it was so that's why I was like oh this is definitely one of my favorite ones because it's been able to capture <laughs> it's been able to capture a feeling in you know a few sentences that I could really identify with definitely I don't think I'd realized how important it was until I was doing the research for Millennial Black and I interviewed one of the founders of um We Are POC which is you can find them on Instagram like We Are P-O-C-C and um, that's a network and a group for black uh, professionals in the creative industries, because my background is in advertising. And they 
said that they found each other to sort of start that organization because they were working in industries and they were like these things keep happening to us all the time but no one is talking about it maybe it's me maybe I'm imagining it maybe I'm overreacting maybe I'm reading in and then they started talking to the very few other black people in advertising and they were like oh no this is real this is real and they are just telling me that it's not and so sort of that like you said not having to explain it not having to sort of frame it in a way that other people can understand but just saying this happened and having someone else with the lived experience being like yes I know that I know that feeling I think is so important definitely definitely um so the next question and we've got a, clue, a few as well that have um come in through um the chat um the book is full of powerful statements one in particular the systems of oppression were not made by us and they cannot be dismantled by us alone and I wanted to link this to your overall wish for this book. Uh, okay. Um, I was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, there's, I think allies is a controversial idea. I think saying that we need other people is a controversial idea. And it's something that I go back and forth on. It's something that I'm aware is going to be a part of my narrative forever. Um, and it's something that I'm aware, as I say, that I sort of stumbled into because it came off the back of an Instagram post that I made when I had a couple of hundred followers and they, you know, it's got typos in it and a duplicated slide and like, it's, em it's embarrassing that it exists, but it's there and that's how it sort of came to be. Um, and I, I think I stand by it. I think we can go beyond allyship. That's a conversation for later, but I think for now, I stand by it because systemic structural institutional racism has on the whole kept black women black people people from marginalized racial backgrounds out of seats of power whether that is in business whether that is in politics whether that is in communities like we are disproportionately underrepresented in these positions and it's easier to make change and to keep things on the agenda and to get funding and to do all of those things when you have power, when you have a voice, when you have access to funds, when you are able to access the spaces that we are largely through no fault of our own, fault of our own kept out from. And so that is my hope. My hope is that, my hope is that we saw people this year who've never thought about race in relationship to themselves say, oh God, I'm not raceless. Whiteness isn't raceless. It's just a race. And I've never thought that I have a voice in this, but I do. And I feel like those people who are newly activated, and I have feelings about that. Like, why are you newly activated? Why is this new news to you? But if you're here now, I want you to pick up this mantle. I want you to pick up this baton and I want you to push it as far forwards as you can. And I want you to take this voice and this message and these words into spaces where it's not got into before. Because if you've not had this conversation, and I get messages from people who are like, I've just signed my first ever petition, made my first ever donation, gone on my first ever protest. And if you are newly activated, you can activate people around you. And that's my hope. My hope is that people stop seeing themselves in a tiny vacuum and become aware of the wider social construct context that they work in and exist in and live in and that they can then use that to spread that message and what I'm not asking them to do is to create their own message people have been doing this work for decades and for generations and if you're brand new to this the, the new idea that you've got might be good. It's probably not something that no one has thought of in the entire history of people doing this work. So it's not about speaking over people. It's not about pushing people out of the way so you can sort of share your great idea. It's about listening to the people who have this lived experience and using your access to spaces to push that further and to take that into new spaces. 
I'm much better at um, being concise in the book than in talking it <laughs> No, I like it. I like it. It allows for expansion. Um, so the last question from me before we go to people's questions is about Black Joy. And I wanted to finish my part of the question about Black Joy. I was really happy that you include this topic in the book. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes being a Black woman, I feel, is framed around a guys of, sh- of strife. And we wanted to re sort of imagine that. Why do you think it's in Black Joy is important and how do you hold space for Black Joy? I think it's so important. I think at the moment we are seeing so much pain. We are seeing videos of people dying in front of us. We're seeing people being hurt and maimed and lynched and murdered. And there's only so much of that that you can take. I really believe that. Like, I've characterized 2020 as just like grieving for people who you've never met. There's a lot of grief and a lot of grief in this community. And I think we saw that when Chadwick Boseman died and people were like, oh, I didn't realize he had so many fans. And it's not about being a fan. It's about having someone who represents hope to you and having that taken away. Um, So to me, black joy is essential because we have to remember that black people and all racially marginalized people are whole people. We're not just our pain, we're not just our suffering. We get taught so often that sort of the history of blackness begins with slavery, begins with pain, and it doesn't at all. We are whole, rounded, happy, joyful, loving, sexual, whatever. We are entire people in the same way that everyone else is, and we have to have space for that and we have to embrace it. Otherwise it's too much. The sadness is too much and it hurts too much. Thank you so much, Sophie. I'm gonna um, go to some of the questions now from um, people who are watching. Um, So the first one is following the mainstream re-emergence of of BLM following the murder of George Floyd, do you feel any resentment or negativity for those who you feel might have hopped on the bandwagon of following activist accounts, including yours, just for a half-baked attempt at helping the cause, or are you just happy that that you can reach a larger audience? It goes back and forth. So if is so they said accounts, right? They're 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 focusing on social. They want to know yeah. about. So it's, it was interesting. It's interesting because it was shocking to suddenly reach so many people. And then it's been really sad in the last month or so to see that really disappear. Um, So it's hard to know. It feels like maybe people were interested when it felt easy. And then maybe they thought that there'd be quicker wins than there have been, which we could have told them from the start that there wouldn't be. It's not a case of one quick action. You were the one person we were waiting for. And now we've got it sorted. Like, I've tried to say to people from the start that we're in this for a long haul and it's a long scenario. Um, So it's hard. I don't know. I don't know, really. It's something I think about a lot. Like, when my posts get fewer likes or, you know, when fewer people respond on a Sunday when I say, what have you done this week to be an ally? I need to think to myself, am I sad that this has dropped off because of vanity? Or am I sad that this has dropped off because of what it suggests about the movement? Um, and I hope it's because of what it suggests about the movement, but I am a person and it is, you know, it's hard to sort of separate those things entirely. Um, what I don't want is to have to have another video of a black person being murdered for people to re-engage. And so I'm glad that they're there. I hope that they stay engaged and I hope that it doesn't take another horrific event happening on film to push us forward further. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think I'm thinking about the comment in the book. I think it might even be one of the chapter headings about it being a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so really links in with what you're saying. And um, so the next question is, how do you balance the need for highlighting injustices and being an activist while also the commercial side of being the writer? without getting blacklisted while raising these issues? Or have you found that not to be the case for you? Do you repeat that for me? 
yeah, sure. So how do you balance the need for highlighting injustices and being an activist, while also the commercial side of being a writer without getting blacklisted while raising these issues? Or have you not found that to be the case for you? I wonder what they mean by blacklisted. What do you think? I think the way I talk it was that maybe because you're raising issues that sometimes can be quite uncomfortable. Well, it is uncomfortable when we talk about Alicia. Do the, they feel that the writers or publishing houses might keep away from you or something because they think it's going to be a difficult discussion or a difficult um, you know, subject to manage? Oh, right. Okay. It is difficult. And I am difficult. <laughs> and that is what I'm here to do. And so I've been, I was lucky that I already had a book deal before I pitched Anti-Racist Ally. And the book that I pitched earlier is more niche. Is um, So I think the audience for this book is quite white, essentially. The audience for Millennial Black is very black. And so it's a harder sell in that way. But it meant I already had that backing before I went to them and said, I want to do something else. I don't know how easy it would be to have that conversation as a start now, but I think the way I often express myself is that I'm not good at picking my battles. <laughs> like I'm not going to change or moderate or downplay what I think or what I believe or what I want to say to fit into a narrative. Like I'm going to do what I think is right using the tools that I have and I'm open to feedback from people. Like when I first started writing, I was talking about like minority people. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm confident this is right. It's not right. I had to learn and change and say marginalized people. So like, it's not that I'm not open to feedback, but if someone's not on board with the message, I don't care. Yeah. And do you think that attitude is important to have in, all, in, the, in the line of work that you do and as, as an activist in general? Yeah, absolutely. So I have to do what I think is right by any means necessary using the tools that I have. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. This next one is um, a personal one to um, the person who put it in. So they've stated, my dad tried to kick me out, essentially divorce me after I tried to discuss a fundamentally racist comment he had made. When conversations regarding racist language from family members escalate into explosive arguments like this, where does one draw the line at fighting for anti-racism? It's hard and I'm probably not the best person to answer this. And I say that because I have a similar experience and I am entirely estranged from my family. I haven't spoken to my parents for a long time because I don't agree with the beliefs that they have. I don't believe them to be helpful. And I don't have space in my life for people who are not willing to fight the same fights as me and who are willing to deny the fundamental humanity of anyone. And so the advice I would give you would be, my cat has arrived, hello. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Just did that little meow. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, the advice that I would give would be sort of, um, with that perspective but it's not an easy path to go down and it's not the path for everybody so I don't feel like I should be uh, the person to respond to that I'm afraid. No and that, 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 that's fine that's perfectly fine thank you for, for that being very honest. Okay so the next question is have you thought about and actually you have have you thought about writing a book for black people and other marginalized populations to help them deal with their own internalized racism Ooh, and help them understand where they're conditioning due to growing up um, in a white dominated um, world can affect their lives. Interesting. So my main area of focus is black women. And that is always who I have been speaking to and about and with. Um, and I am as shocked as anyone that the audience for my first book and the audience on what is sort of my primary communication channel, which is my Instagram at the moment, is primarily white people. I didn't see it coming, but that's the audience that came and found me. And I felt like if I had that as a captive audience or an engaged audience, then I had a responsibility to sort of do whatever I could to push that conversation forward. And in the beginning, that was tricky. Like I had to learn how to talk to this entirely different demographic to what I was expecting. And, you know, 
I have to think about like what does that do to the primary audience who I want to speak to and I want to engage with and that's something that I struggle with and that's something I have to sort of have serious long thoughts about um but yes millennial black is a book by for about black women and I am really lucky I get to interview some amazing black women in it I interview Monroe Bergdorf I interview um Candice Brathway I interview Naomi Aki who's in the Star Wars films I interview all kinds of incredible black women again to get those intersectional perspectives like what is it like to be a trans black woman what's it like to be a queer black woman what are all of these experiences like but then have I thought about what it's like to have I thought about pitching a book rather that is about internalized racism I haven't thought about it because this year <laughs> it's October this year I've written two books yes. um and I have literally typed so much that all of the vowels on my keyboard now if I touch them they just the, those keys come off on my finger um so I think HarperCollins need a little break from me and I need a little break to get my laptop repaired um <laughs> but then we'll sort of figure out what happens next um brilliant thank you for that and I think the point you made about um your audiences is quite an interesting one in for us the goddess projects was set up for black women um, and for what we call women of colour to support them and they're our primary audience. We don't really do anything for anyone else. So when we, the reason why we ended up doing the Ally 101 training was because our women asked us to, because they were talking about how they, the white people within their lives or the white people that they knew or maybe people at work, the impact of um, operating in these spaces and having to be the educators. So the way we looked at it is like if we could do something that was structured and protected us and protected them, then we would be benefiting them because the people would have access to that information without it being emotional labour for, for, for our women. So but for us, we've been in exactly the same position. We had long conversations about should we be actually doing this? Is it our role? Is it detracting from um, our actual main purpose of supporting our women? Um, so I can understand that sort of internal struggle sometimes about you know what you originally set up for, what I hope the overall sort of sort of combination of what you're doing allows for a better will for everyone. So that was the way we sort of like came to came to head with that one. Right. Yeah, so I'm, just gonna... I'm hoping too. Um, but I did have to. I, I have had serious worries about anti-racist ally as a book like I've had much less time to write it than I had Millennial Black it's for an entirely different audience and I have worried like does that detract from my main work does that detract from what I'm trying to do like I had to write it so quickly I'm like well if it's shit what's that gonna <laughs> mean about like what's that gonna do to the books I've spent years working on for this other audience and so yeah it is I think really an interesting balance. And I agree with you that that sort of burden of education should not sit on black women's shoulders. And that's why in Andrea Sassali, out last week, I um, say like, do not ask black people to educate you. I'm gonna do this so your black friends do not have to. So I'm hoping that in sort of things like that, we can be valuable with, without detracting from that sort of message. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so the next question is, um, the organisation I work for made a statement about being committed to anti-racism. It has taken a few steps so far, e.g. trialling type training type event, but the organisation is nowhere near it as diverse as it should be. I worry that the leadership is not committed to real meaningful change. Do you have any tips for keeping up the pressure for change? So I really recommend that people work with like-minded people. Um, one, because it's exhausting work, and two, because if businesses can see that a significant uh, number of their employees have a, the same requirement and the same commitment, then they're more likely to make change. Um, and then I've spoken to people like one-on-one -on -one and we've gone back and forth, and it's got to the stage where it's just like, but they keep doing this or they keep not doing that. And then don't forget that you can leave you don't have to work for a business that does not treat you well. You do not have to work for a business that does not respect you. Like, I'm not saying go in tomorrow and pack your bags, which actually wouldn't work because most of us are working from home at the moment. Um, but what I am saying is make a plan. How's your CV looking? 
what training can you get your business to give to you while you're still working there? Like make a plan, upskill. The pressure for making change within your business is not on your shoulders. It's on the shoulders of senior business leaders. And there is a real financial business benefit to businesses getting it right. But if they don't, you do not have to work there. Them recruiting is expensive. Recruiting is hard and it's long. <laughs> businesses don't want to do it. If you can lay clearly what you need and what you expect, and if you can have a group of like-minded people who do the same, and businesses still won't make that commitment despite there being a business benefit for it, then make a plan. Get some other revenue streams, figure out what you can do, lay some groundwork, do some networking. You're not trapped. I hope you're not trapped. There are things that you can do. There are places that you can go that will value you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and this question is quite a long one, so I'm going to see if I can try and condense it. Basically, somewhat has, has said that they teach English in a majority white working class school where many students are low income households, which means they often um, struggle to understand the concept of privilege. Um, I try to encourage students to think about how race, gender and age um, factors into discussions, but sometimes it becomes difficult. Do you have any suggestions on how to approach discussions of intersectionality, particularly with young people? Yeah, I guess young people isn't my primary audience. Um, privilege is where you don't have to struggle is the thing that I have found is the best way that I've been able to express it. So we can ask people to think about the things that make them up. We can ask them to think about how old they are, what communities they're part of, what their skin color is, what their background. Like, we can ask people to really start to break themselves down into different terms. Because I don't know about you, but when I was young, I didn't get asked to do that. I was one thing. I think we can start to teach people that they are multiple things. And then we can ask people which of those things society says are good and which of those things society says are less good. The things that society says are good are likely to be the places where they're not struggling. And we can acknowledge that and we can sort of look at how we frame that as privilege. And then the areas where they're not doing as well, I don't know how I expressed it the first time, um, those might be their areas of disadvantage. So I think it's really useful to explain to them that you can have one person who has all of these different elements and those different elements are either uplifted or marginalized. So just really like getting them to look at themselves or even getting them to look at like characters and TV or films or whatever, just to acknowledge what they're made of and how those different elements all come together. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, I just wanted to ask, because obviously the book, the current book is out at the moment and you've got Millennium Black coming out next year. What is next for Sophie Williams? This whole thing has been a big accident. <laughs> <laughs> like, a happy accident. <laughs> none of this has been planned. Like, I started working in advertising because someone from Saatchi phoned me and was like, do you want to come for an interview? I, I have no idea how that happened. And I was like, okay. Like I started this Instagram as a channel. And I was like, maybe I'll get 2000 followers by 2021 when this book comes out. Like I've not had plans. And I think I have just been willing to go with the flow. So people love asking me what's next. If you told me two months ago, even when this started happening, that this would be how we are now I wouldn't have believed you and so I'm going to keep being open I'm going to keep trying to use my voice I'm going to keep being bad at picking my battles um I'm just going to give it a go and see what happens I hope that my work continues to make me feel like I'm trying to help marginalized people whatever that area of marginalization might be um that's it. Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Amazing. Um, before we finish off, Sophie, is there any um, 
Um, I wanted to ask you two last questions. Is there anything in particular you want to say about uh, Millennium Black coming out or the book at the moment that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Um, and then the other one was to, it was the any like final ways that you would like to leave with our audience? Yeah, so about Millennial Black, I think, um, as I've said, it's for and about Black women. But again, because Black women are so often in um, more junior roles within businesses because of occupational segregation, not because of their lack of talent, it's important that people who are not Black women also read it, that they understand the working landscape for Black women, that they understand the role that they can have in making that a fairer, better, more equitable landscape for everybody. So although it's a book by for about featuring black women, everyone needs to sort of be part of that conversation in the same way that they need to be part of the allyship conversation. Um, Anti-racist ally, I made it as cheap as I could. <laughs> I made it as small as I could. Uh, I made it as easy as I can. I hope that people will engage with it and like it. Like, I don't care how you access it. I don't care if you pirate it. I don't care if you get it from the library. I don't care if you borrow it from your mum. Like, I don't care. Like, this isn't um, a revenue driving exercise for me. This is an awareness driving exercise for me. And so like, like Natalie, you've got the PDF, send it to whoever you want. I don't care. Spread the word. <laughs> That's sort of what is the important part of this. And then I guess anything to leave people on is that I'm glad that I've been open I'm glad that I have not had a plan and just let things happen as they happen. And I am glad that I have really learned this year that an individual voice can be powerful and can travel. And so many people send me messages and they say, I don't have a platform, I can't do anything. And I want you to realize that you can do so much more than you imagine and that you are so much more powerful than you imagine. And when you team up with people, you can do things that you couldn't ever have dreamt of. Um, so I want people to keep working and keep trying. And I think that together we can make something special. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sophie. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us tonight. We feel privileged and um, to be able to have these really important conversations and for us to be able to expand on some of the brilliant ideas in the book. I've read the book. I love the book. You should go and get the book by any means necessary. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. It's bite sized and it really allows you to begin that um, um, the journey in, in, with critical thinking around being an activist and about allyship and what it actually means to us as people and um, so thank you so much Sophie and um um have you have you ever been to Liverpool before <laughs> um it, it would have been lovely to have you here face to face but it's been lovely to have you here virtually as well um so yeah get the book and keep an eye out for Millennial Black coming out next year so I'm really excited about this book especially because it's directed um at women um I think it's going to be something that we really sort of get a lot from. So thanks very much, thank Sophie. No, thank you for having me. And also, what are your events tomorrow? So you're doing, you're doing WOW events tomorrow as well, aren't you? Yes, so um, we have one of the things that we started with the Goddess Project was a book club. Um, I think one of the things we realised is that I'm like, I'm a, I'm a, a big reader um, and I'm into fantasy books um, and fantasy writers more than so there's no more black women now but there does tend to be a lot of white men in fantasy and my whole bookshelves I was just like where are the black women so we talked about the how we could talk about some of these issues and themes but um using a book club as a um as a, as a guide really so we've done some amazing events up to now we um had the first scouser so the first Liverpoolian black woman novelist Bess um, um, um Rose Thomas she was in the 70s and um wow published the book originally and um, we've done slaying your lane we're doing the second slay the second one la black girls and um, that's the one that we're doing tomorrow and um, we've done um tony morris and the bluest Style, loads of different types of of books um that allow us to really have them and they're all black women in women of color so we don't read a book that's not by a black woman because it's important for us to be able to to listen to different voices um locally and also right across so We've got our book club, but we're, we've got something called TGP Fest at the moment, um, which is the Goddess Projects Festival. Um, and we've done um, about nine events in various different things. Um, like uh, we've got like a playwriting course within Liverpool, Everyman and Playhouse. We've got um, 
I'm not your superwoman about black womanhood um, and about sort of that superwoman trope. Um, and we've got sort of our strategy event, which we're going to be launching our new strategy for the next 12 months on Friday. Um, and like a creative competition and things like that. So loads of different things that um, just focus on black women and um, women of colour because we think it's important to have them them spaces for us. So the event tomorrow is the Book Club Allow Black Girls. Um, and we're really excited to, to get stuck into that. Um, I've got to finish the rest of it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> go to bed and um, but it's in like um chapters by 20 different writers so it's um, been really really good to read so that's what we're doing and then the other thing that I'm involved in is I'm launching Sky Writers which is um, a creative education platform for um adults and children around confidence and self-esteem um, and um sort of community cohesion um and um, personal development um, in a way that supports people, but sort of using creative means and able to do it, um, but also links into activism, because that's sort of an area that I'm involved in, um, about how to get so something from an idea into an actual a living, breathing action, because this is what we've done with the Goddess Projects and the Period Projects and things like that. So um, that's what we've got at the moment. Um, and obviously, with it being Black History Month, everything's really, really busy. Um, I try and fight against that. I quite try, try and, like spread things out in the year but then every year in October <laughs> something on every evening as I'm sure um, you can understand as well <laughs> brilliant <laughs> brilliant yeah, thank you so much for your time it's been thank amazing really and yeah, people should definitely make sure that you also check out Natalie check out the goddess project check out sky writers keep involved with the wow festival yeah let's all just be part of each other's communities that's it brilliant thank you so much thank, thank you, you. I'm so sad that this event has to end. I've literally been sat like, ah, oh, I've written so many notes that you probably not got. <laughs> well, I'm not doing the questions, so we can't ask. Um, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to you both, Sophie. The book is absolutely wonderful. If you go out and buy it, please do. You can get it from independent bookstores, such as News From Nowhere. Um, and and keep an eye out for the work that, that Sophie's going to be doing. The next book sounds absolutely wonderful. And a huge thank you to Natalie as well, who's a, a long-time friend of, of WOW uh, and does a lot of work with us. And, and I'm sure that um, whoever's doing the comments for the Facebook will put you a link to both of our guests this evening um, so that you can have a look at the work that they're, that they're doing as well. Um, like both Sophie and Natalie said, we're not quite over yet. Um, we've got the Black Gaelic Club tomorrow um, with the Goddess Project. And then we've got the, the launch of our book, um, SS Orbital to Orbital, um, about the Windrush generation. So please do come in and, and see those events and support us. We've got, you know how it rolls from now. There's a monitoring form that we're going to put in the comment section. If you can fill that out just so that we, we can get some feedback. And also, um, if you'd like to donate to us, then all of our events are currently completely free. Um, but we do always kind of take donations and that link will be in, the, in there for you as well. And you can say thank you to our funders, which is the National Lottery, Steve Morgan and the Liverpool City Region Mayor's Fund, who are making um, all of this possible. And... Um, have a great evening and we'll see you all very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.